everybody. So we're out in the shop and today we're working on the Warncliffe knife. So this one right here, made out of 5160. Now, in this video, what we're gonna focus on is the heat treat process. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a couple of test pieces with the 5160. I'm gonna normalize them, heat treat them, snap them, show you all the grain structure and the difference between the two. Now, in this video, we're gonna focus on a couple of things. What is super important to have the most forgiving heat treat possible. Now, a lot of people talk about how you're gonna heat treat, what you're gonna bring your knife up to, what you're gonna quench it in, things like that. And then every once in a while, you'll see somebody say, well, the process starts with normalizing. That's not always the case. It's not, not everybody tells you that that is the beginning of what leads to a good heat treat. Now, normalizing isn't super important. If you're going to just do stock removal, I would still do a round of normalizing just because you'll know exactly what you did to the steel and you're not trusting the manufacturer's normalizing process or annealing process. You know what you did to get it to where it's at. So I always suggest at least do some normalizing. If you're going to use a forged steel or something like 5160 that was a, made from a reclaimed like leaf spring or something like that, uh, you're definitely going to want to normalize it even if you don't forge it. Now, you're going to have to do some forging because you're going to have to flatten it to turn it into bar stock to then do your stock removal. But I would 100% normalize that three rounds. Uh, my goal for normalizing. And I'm just going to tell you all of this and then we're going to do it. I'm not going to do a voiceover on that part. So we're just going to do it and then We'll come back and talk some more. But my normalizing process, it's not the same as everybody else's process and everybody else's process isn't the same as everybody else's process, if that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. But what I do is I bring the steel up to about, depending on what I'm working with, uh, with 5160, I'll typically bring it up to between 1750 to 1800 degrees. Uh, I'm doing that purely based on the color that I'm seeing. Um, and then I go to, so up to that temperature, let it cool, and I just bring it to the edge of the forge. I don't take it out of the forge and put it on something or put it in a vise or leave it in the forge. If I'm annealing, I'll leave it in the forge and let it cool as slow as possible. I want it to cool at a pretty medium pace. So up to about 1750 to 1800, bring it to the edge of the forge, let it cool, put it back in there, bring it up to about... 1600 degrees, pull it up, let it cool, put it back in there. I bring it up to about 1450, so basically just that non magnetic, which is about 1420 degrees. And then I let it cool. And then I go ahead and I bring it up to about 1550 degrees, which is you get to non magnetic and then you go just past that. And I quench it at that temperature in 120 degree peanut oil, okay? Uh, I have Parks 50, I have AAA, I have uh, canola oil, I have peanut oil, I have all kinds of different things to, to quench in. Uh, I prefer peanut oil with my 5160 because that is a repeatable thing that I've done multiple times and I know what that heat tree is going to do to 5160 for me, so that's what I use. It's all about repetition. The more you see that color temperature and that successful knife each time and edge retention, you know exactly what to do. You're gonna bring it up to that temperature, you're gonna see what color it is, you're gonna quench it in your 120 degree oil, and you're gonna get the same process and the same hardness each time because there's a science to it, but there's also a really easy, repeatable, thing to this. Once you kind of get your process down, you can repeat that over and over and over and over again, and you're going to have pretty much the same outcome. The only factors that might change that is 
if you use the same exact peanut oil for 50 knives, you're going to eventually break that oil down and it's not going to quench as fast or as slow as you need it to quench. So there's going to be things like that that you got to think about. Um, now, for this, we're going to go ahead, we're going to hop in the other shop, we're going to normalize our pieces of steel, then we're going to go ahead and we're going to uh, bring them up the tent and we're going to quench them. I'm not going to show you the normalizing process for the little scrap pieces of steel because I am going to show you the normalizing process on the knife itself. Uh, we're going to do the scrap pieces first, we're going to snap them, then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about their grain structures. And I'm going to show you another knife grain structure that had no normalizing so you can actually see the difference between them. So let's jump into it, let's get this thing done. Alright, so I ended up doing three pieces of steel, but I didn't want to use the one that was thinner. I wanted to use the two pieces that had pretty much the same thickness to them. That way <clears throat> we had a very similar heat treat process. Now with these, you should have saw two completely different temperatures. So we had one that was quenched actually a little bit colder than what I would typically quench this. So the reason why I did that is because whenever we quench the actual knife itself, you'll see the exact temperature of what I'm going for. So I did one just at non-magnetic, and then I did one at about 1800 degrees. So the first one that you saw go in, that one had no flare-up. The knife went into the oil, and there was no flame. The one that went in at 1800 degrees, lots of flame and then you'll see whenever we do the actual heat treat process on here where we quench this one you'll have a little bit of a flame and then it'll go out so you'll see on forged in fire those huge flames that they do a lot of the times the reason why you have those huge flames and the judges will tell you right when they do it holy crap he's going in there with the hottest knife ever uh, you'll see it they're glowing almost yellow and uh, they quench it in the oil, flames go everywhere, people get their beards burnt, all that stuff. That's because they're quenching super hot. And whenever you quench super hot, you risk cracking, you risk all kinds of different things, uh, your grain structure messing up. The people that quench seven times, you know, they're, they're risking so much issues with their blades because of that. So, typically whenever I heat treat and I quench, there's not much flame or flare up at all. Um, it's all about figuring out what works, doing that thing. Now, unfortunately, fire, you don't have much time to, to do things like that. You're panicking because you're trying to make a freaking knife in hours as opposed to days. So it is what it is. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a cutaway so you can actually see the grain structures of these up close. So on this first one, you'll see the grain structure is actually really smooth. This right here just goes to show how much normalizing can give you a really lenient and forgiving heat treat process. So this has a really good grain structure for something that was quenched colder than normal because you did those rounds of normalizing and you were able to get a good heat treat because you were able to refine that grain structure going into your heat treat process. Now on the second one, you can see that the grain structure is a little bit larger because we quenched it whenever it was too hot and it 
did not let it f form the right grain structure because of that. Now, because we did the normalizing cycles, it was able to still get a little bit smoother grain structure and it would be an okay knife, but it's not what we're looking for. Now, I'm going to go ahead and show you a third one. Now, on this third one, this was a knife that was heat treated, so heated up and quenched without any normalizing cycles. And you can see how large that grain structure is, and that is absolutely not what we're looking for. So, that is the difference between normalizing and doing a heat treat process, and it making your heat treat process more forgiving as opposed to what you see here where we did no normalizing and because of that we had a huge grain structure. Now guys, now that y'all have actually been able to see the grain structures, this is why whenever you think about a heat treat process, it needs to be the whole process. It can't just be, okay, heat up my knife, put it in oil, it's successful. A lot of people think that that is the case, you know, they think that okay, I've got to learn how to forge, or I've got to learn how to get smooth grind lines, or I, I got to make sure that I'm picking the right handle material and pin material and all this stuff. That's all great, and that does lead to a good end product, but if your good looking end product has that super large grain structure like you saw on the one that was not normalized at all, you're going to have some issues. You know, you're going to have a good chance that whenever that person tries to baton that knife through something, that they're going to crack it. Because that huge grain structure is going to cause little areas that it can snap whenever they actually try and beat on it. So, a lot of this goes into the metallurgy part of this and making sure that you take your time to normalize, to do the right heat treat process and to make sure that you do test pieces with the steel that you're going to work with if you've never worked with it. Let's say you decide, I've been working with 1080 for a while, I've got good processes with this heat treat, I'm going to jump into 1095, I'm going to do the same exact process and I'm going to have a great blade. You're going to be wrong. 1095 is not a very forgiving steel. A lot of people try and tell people that hey, Start working with 1095, it's going to be great. Nope. There are soak times when it comes to 1095. You know, so you're trying to get it to a temperature and then you want to keep it there for about 10 minutes. Well, that's not easy on a regular little home forge. If you have a kiln, it's pretty simple. But on a home forge, you got to focus on that. You know, it's, it's not that super simple process. You might think because you got a nice hard edge that you had a really successful heat treat, but there's a good chance that if you snap that, your grain structure was not going to be silky smooth. So I know that not a lot of people want to snap their finished knives. I don't suggest doing that. I suggest getting you some test pieces and snapping those and making sure that your heat treat process is done correctly. It's important. And I just 100% think that you should do things like that because unless you have a kiln and you, you know exactly what your temperatures are going to be and all those things, it's nice to actually pay attention to what your steel looks like, uh, the temperatures of your oil, the things that you can control by just paying attention to what you're doing. And then you can replicate that multiple times over. So let's go ahead and let's jump into heat treating this knife. We're going to Go ahead, we're going to normalize it, we're going to heat treat it, and then we're going to go ahead and put it in our oven, and I'll hit on the uh, oven temperatures and the whole point behind tempering whenever we get to that point. So let's get this done. Let's get it.
All right, guys, so we have it in its tempering oven right now. Now, this is just a Mainstays brand toaster oven from Walmart. Uh, you do want to make sure that if you're going to get one of these, that just get one that can go up to 400 plus degrees. Now, what I do is I go with 375 degrees, anywhere from one hour to two hours. Some people do two cycles, so they'll do 375 degrees for one hour, take it out, go for another hour, and then let it be. There's no need to do that. Don't do two cycles. Just either temper it for one hour or temper it for two hours. You're not going to get any different results by taking it out and tempering it again. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, just temper it all, whether you go one hour or you go two hours, do it all in one go. Make it easy on yourself. Now, <laughs> when it comes to tempering, the whole point behind this is to soften the steel a little bit because once you get done heat treating your knife, it is super hard and super brittle. You want to make sure that you're going to temper some of that hardness out so that you have a nice working blade because the first time someone batons something that is that brittle, you're going to shatter it. You don't want that to happen. So you want to temper that hardness out a little bit. I will tell you one of the things for me, I personally don't soften my blades as much as some people do. So some people will do the two hours at 375 degrees or 400 degrees. Um, I typically don't do that. I will go for about an hour. Uh, I want to get just a nice straw color and then I stop it there. Uh, I don't want to make it too soft. Uh, the first time I heard about somebody even thinking about this, it was uh, me watching a Jason Knight video or one of his, you know, out in the woods vlogs and talking with a few guys. And uh, he was talking about, you know, everybody nowadays tends to over temper their blades because they want to do that two hours at 400 degrees and then it's not necessary. So I actually stopped doing that two hour thing and most of my knives are tempered at about one hour. So, you know, take that for whatever you want, but it's just a personal, my opinion on what I do and everybody's got their opinions and everybody's going to do things differently. That's what I do. Now, tempering is a big thing, like I said, because you want to soften that steel and make it to where you have a nice working blade, something that can be banged around and you don't have to worry about it. Uh, just absolutely cracking or shattering or some crazy stuff like that. Um, now, whenever we heat treated this, we had the, the flame come up. That was a, even though it seemed like a lot of flame, that was actually a really small flame because you got to think, I'm quenching this stuff in a one gallon paint can. So what might look like a big flame uh, compared to that is really a flame that's like that tall and like that wide. <laughs> so uh, you want to make sure that you're not quenching your stuff and that bad boy is flaring up with a big old flame in your face. If you quench it and it does that, for one, you're either using motor oil or you are quenching it way too hot. So make sure you focus on stuff like that. But guys, that is pretty much the end of this video. I am interested to see what your bigger takeaways was from this video. If you would, go down in the comment section and tell me about it. Now guys, that's it. We're going to let that temper. I'm going to go ahead and work on this tomorrow and the next day and we're going to get y'all a video for Sunday. My goal for that video is to go ahead and get everything cleaned up from this heat treating process and tempering process. Get it all cleaned up on the 2x72, get my bevels nice and smooth and then we're going to go ahead do our maker's mark. We are going to acid etch it and then put our finish on it. Hopefully it works out. Like I said, I'm going to be acid etching it but I'm leaving it at the 36 grit belt grind lines on there. So we're going to acid etch it and then we are just going to sand the tops off of it and hopefully get a cool looking effect. We're going to see how that goes. <laughs> if it works out, great. If it doesn't, we'll do something else. But that is the goal for next video. Guys, thank you all for coming by. If you all would, give this video a thumbs up, share this video or one of my other videos. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell. And guys... I just want to thank y'all for, again, coming by, watching this video. Y'all have an amazing day. Y'all stay safe out there. I'll catch y'all next time.